Hi, I'm Annie Leonard with The Story of Stuff. Welcome to another episode of The Good Stuff, where we meet people who are working on solutions to the take-make-waste system that's trashing our environment and stifling a sustainable economy. On today's show, we'll talk to the coolest 11-year-old in the southern U.S. Like many people, he was troubled by the wasteful packaging of fast food restaurants and how it's threatening southern coastal forests. So he decided to make his voice heard. Then we'll learn more about these unique and valuable forests and the campaign to save them. We all see dozens of problems every day. Hundreds of things we know could be done better. A restaurant could stop using styrofoam. A school could serve healthier food. Clothes could be made to last. But what can we do? It's hard to take the first step, and sometimes we feel alone. One of the things we hear most often at the story of stuff is, "I want to do something, but I'm only one person." Duh, we're all only one person. By joining together, we become lots of people. That's how we build our power to make change. What if you were just one kid? You're in second grade, and you find out that fast food restaurants are using non-recycled paper, adding to the pressure to cut down the forest that you love to play in. Do you wait until you're older? Do you join with others and take action like Cole Rassenberger? He's 11 now. In second grade, Cole learned about the threats to forests from fast food packaging, and he took action. He organized hundreds of classmates, gathered signatures, gave speeches, sent postcards to corporate offices, and with some friends and his mom, traveled 600 miles to meet executives at KFC. Yeah, this is Cole. So when I read about your work, it seemed like one of the first inspirations for you to get involved in this stuff was because you love forests, and mm-hmm. I could really relate because I love forests too. I grew up and did a lot of camping, and it was really for me a love of trees that inspired me to to get involved in being an environmental activist. So I wanted to ask you, what what do you love about forests? Um, I just love that like if. We have like an endangered animal. That's where they could live, and forests are very peaceful. So if you like need a place to sink or something, you could just go and like maybe do something out there. That's so cool. So when I was your age, I spent a lot of time in the forest, and I loved them for the exact same reasons you do. And I didn't know until I was older in college and studying about ecology, I didn't know all the reasons that we actually need forests to live on this planet. That forests play a big role in protecting the water, in providing clean air, all these kind of invisible things it does. The forest does to keep us alive on this planet. So I was thinking about you and your work, and I was thinking about how easy it is for some people to ignore all those really important roles that forests provide. And you butted up against some company executives that seem to have forgotten or ignored all those things. So can you tell us what you did to bring it back to their attention, remind them how important forests are? So, well, like when I was in second grade, I had a TD project to write a government official and try to change something. So I. Um, I first got McDonald's because they're um a big company and they were the first to start. So what were you asking McDonald's to do? I was asking them to change their paper to maybe just a little bit of post-consumer recycled fiber, because just a little bit would save a lot of trees. And how'd you ask them? Um, I had postcards about two thousand, and I got my school to sign them, and then. I sent them to the、um, the head of McDonald's. So when I did that, they wrote me a letter back and said to me that they would change their bag to a hundred percent. When you were taking these postcards around to get your classmates to sign them and collecting those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of postcards, what did your friends think when you told them this was important? Did they think you were crazy? Did they agree? How did you convince them to get involved? I had a lot of friends that really cared for the forest, like me. The guy named Nick. I've known him since I was really, really little, and he loves animals just like me. So, I got my friends and his friends to do it, and they were like, they were actually kind of excited to do it. Okay, so now that you got McDonald's to improve their packaging, what's next? Um. Well, after that, I tried to go to F-、uh, KFC because they're such a big company. And so, if I I thought if they would change their、um, products to a little bit of post-consumer recycled fiber, 
that would make other um like re- fast food restaurants to change. So when I did that, um I this time I flew out to KFC with two of my friends and my sister and I went to their headquarters and asked them if they would change their paper packaging to um a little bit of post consumer recycled fiber. They told me that there has to be amount of how much recyclable products can be on food. They told me that they couldn't change it all the way, but they might, they're like thinking about it and stuff. I find it especially amazing because we get a lot of letters from people at the Story of Stuff project where they say, I want to do something, but I'm just one person. So there's nothing I can do. And so then I think of you, you're not just one person, but you're just one 10 year old. I mean, that is totally amazing that you did this as a 10 year old. So what advice do you have for other people, kids or adults, who want to help make the world better, but they feel intimidated or nervous to start? My teacher told me, everybody in the class, that everybody has a voice. So when they go up against something, they shouldn't think that they're not as great as adults or something. Like, they have a voice. They can speak with it. Well, don't be scared. And if they say no it's fine you can always try you tried but like i did i kept on going so if you are scared that you feel like you can't use your voice very well i would just try because when you try you they usually well like you usually do pretty good That's true. I also think that it's really good to enroll other people. You know, some folks say they want to get involved, but they're just one person. If you get your friends to help you, then you're not just one person anymore. Then you're already a group. And having friends involved is really helpful. Was that a helpful thing for you? Yeah. Like, it would be hard to go all to all the classrooms in my school and get everyone to sign a postcard. So I had about um, 25 friends. Um, go to every classroom in my school and ask the teacher if they could sign a postcard. And then at the end, I had like 2,000-something postcards. If you could say one thing to all these big companies, what message would you tell them? This is what I wrote to the kids in, um, for the postcard. Everyone is worried about our rainforest, but we need to be aware of what's happening to our North Carolina forest. North Carolina coastal forest has the highest concentration of different tree species, aquatic diversity, and wetlands in North America. These forests have the richest temperate freshwater ecosystem in the world. We have 31 million acres of southern coastal forests, but thousands of acres are being destroyed daily. Unfortunately, some animals and plant species are on the endangered list because their environments are gone forever. These coastal forests are important air, fil- air filters, and cutting them down will intensify global warming the same way losing rainforest does. So that's what I wrote on my postcard. What do you think other kids can do in other parts of the country if they don't live near the North Carolina forest? What can other kids do to help protect the forests in North Carolina and everywhere? Well, they could maybe start a campaign. Maybe they could do Venus flytrap because that's an endangered animal or well, plant in the coastal forest and they there that's where like they only live so if we don't stop the cutting of the forest those venus flash ash will be gone forever that's amazing what other animals are there there's a lot of deer beavers everything that you'd find in like a big regular forest so are you going to keep doing this work as you move into um, middle school and then high school yeah i'll do it And maybe start working on some other fast food restaurants and see if they'll change a little bit. And what do you think you want to do for a job when you get out of school? Have you thought that far ahead? I might want to be an environmental activist or like an anesthesiologist or a uh, like a vet because I've always wanted to be a vet since I was really little. Well, I have to tell you, since I'm an environmental activist, it is so fun, and I really recommend you look at it. But one of the cool things about being an environmental activist is you don't have to have that be just your job. You can be an environmental activist no matter what you're doing. So if you decide to be a vet, you can be an environmental activist in terms of things like making sure the waste from the veterinary clinic is handled well. Or if you're a scientist, you can design products that are good for the environment. Or if you're an artist, you can do art that helps to communicate about the environment. Is it really you can be an environmental activist? activist now in any job anywhere on the planet. Yeah. 
we got to protect our forests or we're going to, like, run out of oxygen and animals that... So, like, for my next generation, I'm, my kids or something might not be able to see some special animals that are endangered in the North Carolina coastal forest. Too often, businesses are just thinking about their short-term product profit or short-term sales. And until we can get everybody, from kids to heads of companies to our elected politicians, until we can get them all to think not just about the environment, but to have that long-term view, like you just said, I mean, that that's really critical for us to turn things around in this country. Yeah. Well, you have a voice, so use it. And, like, that's basically the message that started my campaign because my teacher told me that I had a voice. A lot of kids have heard about the destruction of the rainforests in the Amazon, but Cole was fighting to protect the forests in his own backyard in the southern United States. Dana Smith of the Dogwood Alliance tells us about these incredible southern coastal forests and about an email that brought her organization into Cole's crusade. Well, the forests of the South are some of the most biologically diverse forests in the world. Um, And what's really special about the coastal forests, which uh, run along the coastal plain from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and parts of Georgia, northern Georgia, um, is it's just an amazing uh, ecosystem interspersed with a tremendous amount of wetland, bottomland, hardwood, wetland forests. So what are some of the big threats or pressures on the forest these days? Well, one of the biggest threats to forests in the South is the paper industry. The South is the world's largest paper producing region. It's only 2% of the world's forests, but it provides 20% of the world's paper products. And what's happening is you're, we're seeing large scale clear cutting, uh, the conversion of natural forests to intensively managed pine plantations. So they're actually been ditching and draining wetlands to make way for pine plantations. So beyond biodiversity, you know, those wetlands are really critical in terms of the communities that live along the coast because the wetlands provide protection for those communities during heavy storms when you've got heavy rains. Um, which are typical in that climate to get tropical storms, and increasingly so in the context of climate change, uh, flooding is beginning to happen downstream. And what kind of paper are we talking about? What are they cutting these trees down to make? Primarily uh, paper packaging, packaging for goods and services. Um, And what we've identified as the fast food industry is a major source of um, packaging coming from the, the mills along the Atlantic coast of the South. Um, and in particular, we've linked the infamous KFC bucket, chicken bucket, to the destruction of wetland forests along the coast of North and South Carolina in the habitat, which represents that last remaining habitat for the endangered Venus flytrap. So this is obviously the issue that got um, Cole Rassenberger interested in these forests. Can you tell us about um, when he first contacted you guys? Well, Cole contacted us via email when he was in the second grade. And from the tone of his email, our campaign director thought that he was in high school. So he sent him a bunch of, you know, reports and links to our website and information about the southern coastland forest and the impacts that the fast food industry was having on coastal forests. It seems like coal is making a real difference. He definitely is. And I think what's interesting is that, you know, right now we're running a campaign focused on getting KFC to change the way they think about their packaging as a way to help protect forests along the coast of, of the south. And, you know, typically a lot of these bigger corporations can sort of label the activists as, you know, crazy people out there that, you know, don't count, that are on the fringe of, you know, society. But when you've got a child involved that is just doing this really from, you know, the most sincere place of wanting to do the right thing, um, it really takes the wind out of their sails in terms of pushing back 
Um, so, yes, his voice has been critically important, and especially in the context of fast food, because so much of the fast food industry targets that younger audience for their, you know, their their, their restaurants. Um, that you know, they're a very important consumer to the fast food companies, and so having Cole's voice in this campaign is is really critical at this point. Sometimes I think that people's vote should be proportional to how much time they have left on this planet. So we should be giving a lot more weight to what kids have to say because they're the ones that are going to be dealing with the reality. And where do you think the really strategic places are to make the biggest change fastest? The real root of this problem is the production and consumption of paper. So if we want to change that, we really have to change the big players, the companies that consume most of the paper. Um, and those big, huge customers of the big paper companies are going to have, in turn, a lot more influence over the paper companies themselves than either you or I would have. Um, so we found that strategy to be the most effective of all, is to move the big market demand on the part of the biggest corporate consumers. And we found today that so many big corporations invest so much in their brand um, that they really, um, you know, that we as a collective grassroots movement working to protect forests or protecting the environment have influence over those companies once we expose their, connect, their brand connection to the destruction of the environment. And so through mobilizing and channeling the voices of all the people who are concerned and linking that directly to the brands of these big corporations, we've been able to make huge progress. So by linking Office Depot's reams of paper, KFC's chicken bucket directly to the loss of the forest, then people can understand the real connections and you can get these companies to change. That's exactly right. And we've gotten, you know, a number of some of the biggest companies in the world to change the way they source paper because of concerns that citizens have been raising about their connection to destruction in the South. Companies like Staples and Office Depot and Office Max, FedEx Office, Johnson & Johnson, GlaxoSmithKline, and even more recently this year, McDonald's. And in the process, what that's done is allowed us to now make progress with some of the bigger paper producers who are now beginning to change the way they source fiber. It's amazing to me the progress that we've made. We still have a long way to go. The paper industry in the South is by no you know, stretch of the imagination is it sustainable, but we're driving change on the ground that's making a difference. And yes, there are still laggards out there like KFC who haven't changed yet and International Paper who's you know, the biggest paper producer in the world and by far in the southern U.S. the biggest. But um, the chips are falling all around these companies and I think it's just a matter of time with continued public pressure that those companies, too, are going to make the changes and set a new course for the paper industry in the region. There are a lot of things I'd like to change about the world, and throwaway packaging is right up there. It's so unnecessary and so easy to change. If an 11-year-old can figure out how to be part of the solution, we all can. As Cole learned right away, an individual voice carries only so far. It's when we come together and raise our voices as one that we can be heard loud and clear. If it feels intimidating to start, look around and find a friend who also cares. Right away, you've doubled your impact. And for whatever issue you decide to tackle, you're sure to find other people and organizations also working on the solution, ready to share information and ideas. They need your help, and they'll help you. Together, we can build a better future. That's it for this episode of The Good Stuff. Our show comes to you from the studios of Youth Radio in Oakland, California. Our engineer is James Rollins. Post-production by Brandon McFarland. The Good Stuff is produced by Bill Walker. We'll have another show online in a few weeks. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Find us on Facebook and storyofstuff.org and keep working on the good stuff in your own community. Thanks for being part of the solution.